Welcome to Into the Light. My name is Donald Schmidt, and my guest today is Pastor Pablo Vargas. Our topic is Father Knows Best. Welcome, Pastor Pablo. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you for having me here. Can you tell us a little bit about your past and how you became a pastor and how you got here? Sure. Uh, I got saved uh, at, a, at a young age, not very young, but uh, I, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior uh, when I was about uh, 11, 12 years old. Uh, my father was actually the one who got saved first and brought my sisters and I uh, to a church in South Attleboro, Massachusetts called South Attleboro Assembly of God. And uh, after a couple of months of going and going to youth group, uh, it became the spot that I wanted to be at. And uh, so I, I continued to go, continued to go, and then I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And uh, the process for me to be where I am today, um, I, I, I didn't take my relationship with God seriously at first. Um, I kind of wore a mask. Uh, I, I lived one way at the church and then one way at school. And... Uh, you know, I know I know that that's something. That I knew that that was something that needed to change after uh, going on a missions trip to the Dominican Republic. Um, you know, I just remember seeing how happy people were um, in, in the simplicity of life that they were living, and uh, that that was something that really opened my eyes to how good I really had it. And I, I remember leaving that trip after serving the people, serving the children, the kids. Um, you know, I, I remember leaving thinking, uh, wow, people really do this for a living. Like, that, that's shocking to me. And uh, upon going the second time the very next year, I, that's, that's when I knew, you know, God has been tugging on my heart uh, for full-time ministry. And so uh, after a long journey, going through four years of uh, Zion Bible College, now North Point Bible College, uh, I just graduated this past May. I got, very, I, I got married that same month. And uh, now I'm here on Staten Island as uh, the youth pastor of International Christian Center. So you've been very, very busy in a couple of months. Oh, very we busy. Were, we, were, we were anxiously awaiting Pastor Pablo and his wife, Rachel, at um, ICC. It's like, when's he coming? When's he coming? Well, he's graduating and he's getting married and you were on like a fast track. All right. Today we're going to look at um, um, a father, a spiritual father-son relationship between the Apostle Paul and Timothy. And it's important to have fathers. You know, we have a Heavenly Father who, who knows us and loves us and cares for us, but we also need uh, mentor-protege relationships where each one teach one. We, we mentor somebody down, we pass it on to the next generation. Uh, they're called Fathers in the Faith. Thus the title, Father Knows Best. And we may plan and plot and scheme, but our Father knows the thoughts and plans He has for us, plans for hope and a future. And Paul, the Apostle, and Timothy's spiritual father, was writing to Timothy, his protege, from prison. Paul is bringing to Timothy the encouragement and remembrance of the faith that both his mother and grandmother had. It may be possible that Timothy was having a difficult time, he was wavering in his faith, and Paul being unable to visit Timothy, so he writes his second letter to Timothy. Prior to Paul being Timothy's mentor, he had a very interesting past. He was called Saul. He was very well educated and extremely zealous. He studied under Gamaliel, who was an acknowledged teacher. Saul was present when Stephen was stoned to death and gave approval of his death. Saul was tormenting the people of the way followers of Jesus by breathing out murderous threats and imprisoning them. One day Saul was on his way to Damascus to cause more wreaking havoc among the believers and he had a white light experience. He got knocked off his horse and he heard, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm Jesus, who you persecuted. And then he was blinded by the light, and he said, Lord, what would you have me to do? His men took him into Damascus, and Ananias was sent by the Lord. He says, I'm going to use this guy. Ananias says, he's a scary dude. I'm afraid of him. He says, don't worry. He's going to reach the Gentiles. And the, the other apostles, they were scared because they didn't know, you know, one minute Paul is killing people, and the next minute he's one of them. 
And that's how the transformation occurs. It happens in like a split second. You know, if, we, if we're not conformed to the way of the world, we can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And this happened in the blinking of an eye to, the, to, the, to Saul of Tarshish, who is now the Apostle Paul. So he writes this letter to Timothy, and it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, father, son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve for my forefathers, with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of thy tears, that I might be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned, genuine faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it is, is in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So there was a whole lot of fear going back there, you know, then and everything. Paul's running rampant, you know, he's locking people up, and the next minute, you know, he's like Mr. Clean. You know, it's right. like, you know, like, what's the story? And uh, what's, your, what's your take on that? How, you know, the, the transformation occurred in, you know, like in a split second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, definitely God, God uh, touched, you know, he, Saul had a, basically a divine encounter, you know, a divine appointment with uh, Jesus that uh, Jesus uh, saw his zeal, his zeal to persecute uh, those who professed him as Lord and Savior. And when Paul... Uh, had that encounter with Jesus, that that zeal wasn't taken away from him, but rather it was redirected. For rather than persecuting the church with uh, a passionate zeal, Paul now that that zeal was redirected into the furthering of Jesus' teaching and and the gospel uh, into all the world. And so that's that's how we see that Paul was able to be such a huge. Uh, asset to the church you know uh, he he wrote more than half of the new testament you know we see how zealous that he was for god because of this uh going on on his missionary journeys and such uh he was he was just uh completely on fire for god till the moment he died it's pretty amazing how um god can take the um the unlovely and and and, and turn them around mm -hmm. you know in in an instant and as i've walked this journey for the last 20 years, because I didn't, I didn't know God until I was 41, I realized that there's hope for everybody. And no matter how far down the scale we go, we can help others and let them know that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And we have a chance. You know, one of the problems in, in society is um, selfishness and self-centeredness and greed and you know, Jesus came to give us life more abundantly, and the enemy wants to steal, kill, and destroy. Right. You know, he wants us to be hopeless and fearful, and the Word said, you know, that he has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And a long, long time, I, w I was in the darkness, and, like, I didn't care. I didn't, everybody, you know, like my mother said, like, you're going to hell. It's like, <laughs> well, everybody else is going, I'll have company. And I didn't, I didn't care. You know, I, I grew up in a Catholic church. Uh, I had Sister Mary up beside the head. You know, and, and my, um, my classroom was in the basement. And it was like bricks and everything. And it was like black bars on it. And um, the name of the church was St. Mary Gate of Heaven. And I listened to what Mommy said. She says, you're going to hell. And every day, they're still there, those black bars. And it, goes, it went down into the classroom. And sometimes we have to go down, and we have to, we have to hit a bottom, and we have to ha have a spiritual void mm -hmm. that only our Lord can fill. Right. And then gradually I changed. It wasn't, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the, the soul of Tasha's experience, but I was rebellious, and I had a 
repent and I had to change and I had to surrender and I had to submit and I had to obey and I had a change of heart. And what the Lord did was he took my heart out and he put his heart in. And it's like weird. It's like I love everybody, you know, and it's like the joy of the Lord is my strength and Amen. I'm excited about life and you know, it's really it's really different and it's really exciting. So tell us a little bit about um growing up in, in Puerto Rico and then you moved to Massachusetts, you met Rachel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh so I was born in uh, Bayamon, Puerto Rico. Um, I moved from Puerto Rico to uh, Massachusetts when I was really young, uh, to the United States when I was really young. Um, you know, I have uh, vague memories of what Puerto Rico was like, you know, family and stuff like that, remembering faces. Um, but uh, growing up uh, in Massachusetts, um, my parents actually got a divorce when I was really young. And so uh, I lived with my mom uh, ma a majority of my time growing up. Uh, with my dad, you know, uh, whatever custody allowed me to see him every other weekend and stuff. And so uh, my, when my dad got saved, that's when uh, we wanted to go to youth group every Friday. And so that's uh, when we started making youth group our uh, weekly thing that if I missed youth group, my whole week was ruined. If I knew that youth group was canceled, I knew it was going to be a long week because I looked forward to uh, those times where you could hang out with friends, uh, you know, uh, it, it was a place really where I felt like I could be myself. Um, and so uh, growing up with that situation, um, my dad actually won uh, custody after years of battling in the courts and stuff like that uh, right around my sophomore year uh, before going on uh, my missions trip, I think it was, sophomore, junior year. And um, that's when, uh, you know, um, uh, I started going to church more, uh, Sundays getting more involved, um, you know, things like that. You know, my dad really pushed us to go because he, he, he loved it. I mean, he was a recent convert as well. You know, we were only a couple months after him. And so uh, that zeal that he had, you know, he kind of pushed us to go to youth group and encourage us. You know, at first we didn't want to go. You know, we were shy. We didn't know anyone. But he just kept encourag uh, encouraging us to go. And uh, eventually we gave in and went um, and stuff. And so uh, growing up with God... Uh, you know, uh, getting closer to him, you know, my relationship with him, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, when you think of a relationship, uh, you think of uh, an investment, you think of time, you think of, uh, you know, spending time with someone, you know, my, my relationship with Rachel, uh, at first we met at youth group, uh, you know, and it, it's really funny because I remember uh, first seeing her and I remember thinking to myself like, whoa, she's really pretty. And uh, it was actually that summer uh, after we started going to church, that uh, we went on a youth uh, camping trip in uh, Rangeley, Maine, I think it was. And uh, I remember coming back from that trip, and it's really funny, you know, God remembers our, our smallest little prayers and everything, uh, even when we at times forget, because I remember uh, coming back from that trip and just thinking and praying to God. I was like, God, if you had a wife for me, I really would not mind if it was her. And, you know, so he, that's something that I forgot about until months before we uh, got married. And, uh, you know, it, it's just funny how God just hears those innocent little prayers, you know, because, uh, you know, we're, we're here today. We've been married for, uh, we've been married since May 23rd, so it's about four or five months. And, uh, you know, God has truly brought us through, through a journey, you know, that we, we can say, you know, it's because of him that uh, we are where we are today. He says, um, I'll give you the desires of your heart. Right. You know, and, and um, you know, something seemingly menial and minuscule was like he knew it. And he knows the thoughts and plans he has for us, plans for hope and a future. And that's for all of us. Mm -hmm. And we didn't always have a purpose-driven life. We had a fear-driven life, a self-driven life, and a flesh-driven life. Right. Now to sit here and, and, and be comfortable under the lights and, you know, on the cameras and on TV, there's got to be a God because before this, I'd be out gallivanting the streets and, and didn't really care. And, you know, I'd go to the racetrack or the bar or both or the bowling alley. And I went to school and there was a school here. There was a bowling alley here and a horse race track here. Mm -hmm. And you could hear the call of the races from the school. And it was like, it was like calling my name. You know, when that bugle went off, it was like 
Donnie, <laughs> Donnie. And the only spiritual dads I ever had, I worked in a candy store. And we want role models. But not every role model is conducive to productivity. I worked in a candy store, and it were these guys, Neil and Artie and Robin, and they, they showed me the ropes in the candy store. And part of that was like taking care of the magazines. So you could get a lot of, in a lot of trouble as a young kid, even if it's just mildly adult pictures. And then there's like a lust and a quest for more. Mm -hmm. You know, like you're, you're young, you're inquisitive. I might have been, I was probably 12. You know, and I didn't have any spiritual dads. And the people I looked up to were the people who were in the bar. And I wanted to grow up, and I wanted to bowl, and I wanted to, you know, I, I remember being 14, and I couldn't wait to be 18 and everything. And now I'm 61. It's like I blinked. Yeah. I was 14, and I blinked, and I was 41. And I blinked again, and like, I'm like 61. It's like I'm not going to blink because I'll be 90. <laughs> you know, it's like, but God's got a sense of humor. You know, he, he uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And blessedly... You were introduced to the Lord. You met your wife, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 you hit it off famously. And now you're both at the church all the time, and you know, reaching out to the kids. And Pastor Pablo has um, such a um, a zeal, and like when there's youth around, he just like he just like switches to, you know, excited. You know, some people have to take pills. Like to get excited, and Pastor Pablo doesn't. He's just like, he's on, he's on go, all the time. Um, a couple interesting things happened in your life where you got hurt, and it was pretty. Yeah, um, it was uh, three years ago. I have a, I have a big scar on uh, over my left eye. Um, it was three years ago. Uh, I, I love fitness. I love uh, exercising. You know, I really believe that uh, that's something that we really need to do. Um, you know, in order to uh, better uh, live, you know, our, our lives, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't want any uh, anything physically to hold me back uh, from uh, being able to go wherever God wants me to go, you know, whether it be that would be a place where I have no car uh, and I would have to walk miles on end a day. Um, you know, I remember uh, w when I was a kid, I, I had actually really bad asthma and uh, I was told by the doctors as a kid, you know, that if I work out and uh, I, I stay fit that uh, my lungs would eventually strengthen, and so that's something that um, that's something that happened. You know, I, I had really bad asthma. You know, almost killed me at one point because uh, my uh, throat closed. But um, you know, by the grace of God, you know that's something that I eventually outgrew of, and I haven't used my inhaler. You know, in like a year and a half. You know, over. You know, just haven't needed it at all. Even after exercises and stuff like that, I pushed myself to not want to depend on it. But uh, so that being said, it was three years ago. Uh, I was in a gym working out with a couple of my friends, and uh, I was on a Smith machine, which if you don't know what a Smith machine is, it's uh, a machine that has a bench press bar attached to it. And uh, while I was uh, working out, I don't, I don't like using that bar because I feel like it's very restrictive. And so I had it hooked uh, at, up top where it's supposed to be, um, and so it was secure. And uh, I had the attachments for a free bar, uh, and so I was using that to bench press. And uh, as I was finishing my set, uh, this was at the end of my workout, like I was literally about to be done, go make dinner and eat. Um, as I was racking it up before I could even let go of that bar, the other bar that was secured up top uh, somehow managed to slip out of uh, where it was secured, and it f came falling down on my uh, face. And so the, the thing w about that was uh, I was doing decline bench press, so I was kind of at an angle upside down almost, and so a lot of blood was rushed to my head. Um, and so uh, it was a 45-pound bar, and so for every mile per hour, a weight falls, the weight doubles. And so uh, when, when I got to the hospital and everything after the accident uh, just happened, uh, the doctors told me that it was a miracle that I was still alive because I had well over... Uh, 270 to 300 pounds come crashing down on my head. They told me my brain should have been splattered all over the wall, but, um, you know, they, they did x-rays, CAT scans on me. You know, I had no crack in my skull. I had no uh, bleeding in my brain, no swelling in my brain. Literally, the only thing that I had 
was uh, a numbness due to the laceration of my nerves, but uh, just that laceration on my face, uh, that, that was it. And so uh, I remember the nurse uh, telling me, you know, that uh, she, she feels blessed to have been uh, a part of uh, seeing me and helping me and tending to me because she knows, uh, she knew that she knew from the moment that I got in the hospital and I was just staying uh, positive, you know, not just thinking anything of it. Um, you know, she knew that uh, God had his hand on me and that's something that she told me that it was an encouragement to her uh, and a, a faith increaser for her, you know, and so uh, that's just a prime example right there of, um, you know, the, what the enemy intends to destroy us God will use to bring himself glory and you know I, I, I don't know if that nurse was uh, at the brim of just giving up on faith or anything mm -hmm. like that but I do know that because of that incident uh, you know her faith was increased and you know she could still be serving the Lord today because of it mm -hmm. you know and so I just give God the glory for that. So God puts us in the right place at the right time surrounded by the right people and we don't we don't even know who we're reaching and who we're helping and I say a prayer not every day, but it's, Lord, show me where to go mm -hmm. and tell me what to say. Yep. And lots of times I get answers and, you know, I have, a, I have a bunch of God stories where, like, God would, like, speak to me and I would, I would listen, you know, because, like, there's a verse say, my sheep know my voice yep. and the voice of another they will not follow. So one day I'm in Manhattan and it's like really hot. I'm volunteering in a church. I hadn't worked in a long time. And I'm volunteering and I'm arguing with the church on what time I'm going to volunteer. But I didn't know that God had a plan. So I go to the church. I go get some soup. I'm over on Fulton Street and Broadway. And I go to the, the singular store for my phone. Right. And I'm there like an hour. So it's like 110 degrees. I'm on my way home. And I hear a voice. I hear the Father's voice. And it says, go to the Marriott. It's like, I'm not going to the Marriott. And the voice you hear, it's in your own voice. It's not like Saul heard on the, the Damascus Road. Right. It, 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 it's just a thought, but it's a good thought. Because I used to get bad thoughts, like, you're a piece of crap, kill yourself. You know, and I said, like, okay. So I says, no, I'm not going to the Marriott. So I went to the Burger King, which is like right by Ground Zero, and the voice isn't going away. Go to the Marriott. Go to the Marriott. So I go to the Marriott. I get to the Marriott. I can't get in because the door's locked. But there's a secret way in through the, the dining area. So I get in. I get to the front. And I say, okay, God, which way? Go left. I go to the left, and there's a woman. She's having a nervous breakdown. She's got a, a shopping cart full of carpet and she's got to go across the west side highway i says hi i'm donald god sent me to help you she says i just prayed five minutes ago i says well i would have been here sooner but i got stuck in traffic and we had a nice little chat you know i i, I told her and everything and she was catholic and we spoke her name was elizabeth and um i walked her home and she's reaching into her purse to bless me i says listen god told me to help you mm -hmm. He's my reward. Because if we're willing and obedient, we'll eat the good of the land. When we hear the Father's voice, and we act on the Father's voice, so I says, listen, but Elizabeth, I'm not going to keep you from your blessing. So it took maybe 18 minutes, and she goes into a pocket. She gives me a $50 bill. I was hoping to see her at church, you know. But we never know who we're going to bless, because we're blessed to be a blessing. We're blessed to help each other. Mm -hmm. And when we go somewhere... We never know who's going to be right. the recipient of God's infinite grace and mercy. Yep. So tell us a little about what you have in store for the youth and how excited you are about what they need to learn and, you know, like each one teach one and each one reach one. Right, right, right. And the results you're seeing as a result of your coming yeah. to ICC. Yeah, um, you know, my, my heart uh, for the youth is for them to just be you know set on fire for God um, the you know the the name of the youth group used to be revival but I changed uh, you know Rachel and I felt the Lord leading us to change it to ignite uh, youth ministry at ICC 
And uh, revival is still our heart. You know, re revival is something that we strive to see. But, you know, I truly believe that in order to see revival first, you have to be ignited for God, ignited on fire for him with that, with that passion, with that zeal uh, to know him and to just see other, others know him and experience that love. And so my heart for the youth is just to really see them so passionate about their relationship with God that they would know that uh, their relationship with the Lord is uh, of the utmost importance. It's the most important thing that uh, they will ever need in life. Uh, you know, Paul tells Timothy uh, multiple times in Second Timothy uh, that uh, his relationship, you know, everything that he's taught him is of the utmost importance, uh, that uh, it's the most important thing that he will ever know and ever need. And, you know, Paul, we, we see Paul, he just trains him up. He spends time with him. Uh, Timothy accompanies Paul on his second missionary journey, we know. And, uh, you know, kind of going back to what you were talking about, that you never know who's going to be blessed where you go. Um, you know, Paul, uh, Paul may have encountered Timothy upon his first uh, missionary journey um, because uh, Paul went to uh, Timothy's native land uh, and so he, he had a great uh, ministry there. I, I forgot what it was called. But, um, you know, Paul eventually comes back there, and Timothy is mentioned by name being a uh, disciple and someone who is very respected and very well known. And, you know, from then on, you know, it, it's almost as if they're a dynamic duo. You know, Paul's just pouring into him. He calls him my son uh, in First and Second Timothy, even in uh, First Corinthians. Uh, you know, it, it's someone that Paul truly poured into and by pouring into I mean everything that uh, he was he was uh, learned you know everything that he learned everything that Jesus was speaking to him he shared with Timothy that way Timothy can take Paul's testimonies Paul's uh, the teachings of Paul which are the teachings of Jesus and you know so on and so forth and he would just be able to go and uh, go wherever the Lord would lead him and so uh, Paul really poured out into that next generation after uh, after he was gone after he was uh, executed um, you know, and Timothy was able to continue uh, doing what Paul was doing with uh, the, the same zeal that Paul had with that passion. Um, and, you know, that, that's why I truly believe in uh, the, the, you know, we need to pour out into that next generation. So now, Paul, in his letter, he knows he's on his way out. He knows he's probably not going to see anything. Mm -hmm. He winds up getting beheaded, and he says, For I am now ready to be offered and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And in other versions say, I have won the race. Mm -hmm. So Timothy would continue with zeal, and he would go to the end, and he wound up being Bishop of Ephesus. I want to thank Pablo, Pastor Pablo Vargas, for being with us today. Uh, it was an exciting journey. And we want to thank all the listeners for tuning in, and we, we give God the glory. You know, all you got to do is believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You'll be saved. Thank you, and see you next time on Into the Light.